Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books, and we are thrilled to share tonight's event featuring award-winning author, fantastic person, Rhea Fry. Now, she's here to celebrate her new book, Secrets of Our House. Now, remember that you can buy signed copies of Secrets of Our House from Parnassus Books, and we'll go ahead and put the link in the, in the comments and the chat, and, um, and you can order them, and you should, because it's a great book. And also, Rhea has agreed to take questions, and you can put those in the same place, and Rhea in the chat in the comments, and Rhea will do her best to answer all of your questions throughout the course of the evening. So we're especially excited because tonight, Rhea is in conversation with Kimberly Bell. Now, many of you know that Kara Ruda was supposed to join tonight, but was unable to. So um, regrets about that. But right now, I am so pleased to turn it over to Rhea and Kimberly. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Thank you. So good to see you face you to face, too. even it's though like we a... have however many miles between us. I know. And we used to do in-person events together a lot. And it's been a minute. One day we will get back to that place, right? Yes, we will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So let's talk about your book. I finished it today. Did. Oh, I did. Okay. So yes, this is <laughs> love the my love. darling husband, which I'm sure we'll uh, mention yes. a couple times too. But yes, first, let's talk about yours because it's been out for what two days, three days? Yeah, I don't even know yeah. what day it is. Yeah, two days. <laughs> <laughs> that should tell you some things. Two days. Yes. <laughs> Two days. So, and it's a little bit different than your previous works, right? It's more a domestic drama, maybe. I didn't even know that was a subgenre, but apparently <laughs> this is this is what I'm writing now. So yes, domestic drama. <laughs> I love it. So why don't you tell everybody what it's about and also talk about the inspiration behind because you know, secrets of our house. Now we need all need to know what the deal is with the house. Yes. So Secrets of Our House is about a super successful businesswoman named Desi, who has really built her dream getaway house, which is called, is referred to as the Black House um, in the book. And she takes her husband, Peter, and her 17-year-old daughter, Jules, there for the summer in hopes of just kind of having a great summer before her daughter goes off to college. And when they get there, everything kind of starts to unravel. Desi and Peter are on the verge of divorce. Her daughter falls in love for the first time and wants to ditch college and kind of play house with her boyfriend, Will. And then Desi's past literally comes knocking at the black door uh, at the black house and threatens to just kind of spill all these secrets that she's worked so hard to keep. Um, so, and it's funny too, because this, this book, the house is a character. It's, it's kind of one of the main characters in the book and, and wilderness is really at play a lot here, which I've, I've never mm -hmm. really written about. And I loved using it as a character, but the inspiration for this house, um, is a, is from a great friend of yours, Emily, <laughs> Parker, when in 2019, I went to her house, we were doing, you and I did a couple or I did an event together. And then she let me stay at her house <laughs> and she was like, come stay at my house. And I'm thinking she lives in a house like me, like just a, just a little cute house. And I roll through these black gates and go down this <laughs> long driveway. And I mean, I was blown away. I think I actually stopped my car and was like, are you kidding me? It was gorgeous. Her house is just yeah. beautiful, black and glass. And, and so as I was taking videos in there, just wanting to remember how much better her life is than mine, <laughs> it was like, I love this as a character, as a setting yeah. for a book. So I kind of filed it away because I, I hadn't started, started writing Secrets of Our House yet, but I really came back to it and just wanted to have the whole book take place there. Yeah. Yeah. It is a fabulous house and it is worthy of a book for sure. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> it is such an amazing house. So, and I also read in the back, you, um, I think in your acknowledgements, you said that this book started out as a very different kind of story that you, 
and it and it evolved into a domestic drama, I guess. Were you planning to write a thriller? Cause I think you said yep. in here that you said, oh, this yep. is a murder house. Oh yeah, it was a murder house. I mean, that was the first <laughs> thing I said when I saw her house, I was like, this is the perfect place for a murder if I've ever seen one. Um, so when I, I wrote the first draft of this, it was way more thriller. I mean, kind of hitting all of your typical thriller, you know, marks and plots along the way. And my editor just really wanted something a little deeper and a little richer with these characters Mm -hmm. and wanted me to just push a little bit. So it ended up wildly different than, than it started. I love that. I love that. Um, so back to the house, um, both of our books, cause mine is is. about a home invasion, right? You got to talk about your right. This (laughs) you write this during the pandemic? Because Uh, yeah, I wrote this in 2020. (laughs) So I wonder if the the story or the inspiration for you was like something that came out of like, we're stuck in our houses and let's write a book about a house, right? Because I did the exact same thing. I wrote this in spring, uh, spring and summer of 2020 when we were all in lockdown, basically. Yeah. Do you want to talk about yours? Because your plot and premise is so amazing. I, I've literally binged your book in a day. Um, and I think it is so wild that they both really center around right. houses, yours more so than mine, because the whole book is almost in this house at this breakneck pace. It's so right. Great. Right. So my darling husband is about a woman who comes home. She's got two kids, seven and nine. They're kind of arguing on the back seat of her car and um, she pulls into the driveway and in the chaos of getting them out of the car, she doesn't notice the man in the corner with a mask and a gun. And he forces his way into their home and holds them basically for ransom for a stupidly high amount of money, like $734,296. So, um, and then it bounces between her trying to keep her kids alive and herself alive and protect her kids um, and her husband, who is basically scrambling all over town, trying to pull together this ransom. And then we also hear from the kidnappers point of view. So it's the three um, points of view. Um, and that's, yeah. It was so good. And it's funny just knowing you and, and when I know authors, I can't help but imagine them as the main characters. So, but I know in your note, this was based off of a friend's story. Right. A little bit, right? Kind of, sort of, yeah. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Um, but I just thought you you hit so well on every mother's terror for sure. Right. And yeah. just someone being, just being in your garage or in your house and, and being held hostage. I just think that's- right horrifying and very relatable. (laughs) Well, thank you. And, you know, I think it was, you know, a lot of the pandemic stuff because we were stuck in our homes. Um, all of a sudden the world was a really dangerous place. And, you know, I mean, it, for me, it was also, and I'm sure you had this too. It was also a nice little reprieve from all the crap that was going on in the world and the scariness, right. You can dive into a story and, and live someone else's life for a while. And that's what I, when I first created this, I always have a dream of, of having a mountain home that looks like Emily Carpenter's house, looks like the house, in, <laughs> but just really that getaway house. And I'm so interested in families who go on vacation or live this dual lifestyle. And they think by going on vacation and get out and getting out of the day to day that their mm-hmm. lives are going to be better and everything's going to be great. And for this family, Desi, Peter, and Jules, it should be just easy and great. But I think when you get there, when they get there and they don't have their daily distractions and they don't have their daily routines, it's very easy to have everything start to unravel and you really start to see the person that you live with in a different light. Um, yeah. It was a real study during the pandemic, right? Like we're literally on top of each other and you're trying not to kill your, your family. And yeah, so I, I think it was an asset being able to use that quarantine time to create almost another, another quarantine world mm-hmm. for these characters. Yeah. Yeah. 
I loved it. And you, um, you also, this is the first book that you've done from like the mother and the daughter's point of view, right? So this was like really, um, not really about their relationship, but it had a big part in the book, right? So, um, and your, I know your daughter is much younger, but I've been through this now twice with my kids, <laughs> that, that phase where they, you know, pull away and kind of go off and do their things and they be, become adults and you can't really, you don't have that much control over them, right? I mean, maybe yeah. some financial control, but that's about it. Uh -huh. And, you know, you have to let them make their own decisions and live their own lives. So how did you, how did you do that? How did you create those characters and, and why did you put them at odds with each other? Yeah. I mean, you just said it. I think that age like 17, 18, about to flee the nest, there can be so much tension and friction, especially between mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. I experienced it with my own mother, like Jules. I, I, mean, I was great at school, but I really didn't want to go to college right away. I either wanted to take a gap year or just go to work. But it was, it was, no, you, this is what you're doing. You're, you're going to college and, and this is, this is what's going to happen. But I wanted to create these two characters that were in really different places in their lives. But it's interesting because Desi is falling out of love when the, when the book starts and Jules is falling in love. So there's this really interesting mirror happening. And I think Jules being so young and so self-aware and self-assured and knowing what she wants out of her life her mother, as parents often do, we think we know best and she doesn't want her daughter to make a mistake or throw away her future for a boy. And as the book goes on, there's a lot of similarities with what Jules is going through um, that really is similar for Desi and her past. She has a love that got away. She has a lot of regrets um, with kind of not following her, her dream and, and her first love. So it's, I don't know, it was fun to kind of toggle back and forth. And I tend to write slightly unlikable characters <laughs> and pretty flawed characters. So Desi's not overly likable. I think she's very concerned with appearance and how things look on the outside and not necessarily the dynamics of really what's going on on the inside. And and how she's really feeling and how she really needs to be there for her daughter. Um, right. I'm just interested in parent child relationships in general. I think it's, yeah. it's really fun to play with on the page. Yeah, I agree with that. I love the the dynamics of, well, actually any familial kind of relationship, husband, wife, you know, son, mother, son, and, father, whatever. It's funny too, because you have the older kids, but in this, in your book, you were writing about the younger kids, the seven and nine. Right. And which is funny because I have a nine-year-old and yeah. as I was reading this, I was like, oh yeah, I can relate though. She was amazing. Your character, you're the daughter. Oh, thanks. I mean, little prodigy, like music yeah. prodigy and just, and yeah, goes on a crazy, uh, I won't give anything away for, <laughs> for readers, right. right. but right. it was, so how did, how was that for you though? Kind of putting yourself back in the seat of mothering a young or your character mothering these young children? So, you know, I think for me in, you know, this, this particular story with two kids whose lives are in danger, then there's also, I have three days missing where a, a boy is, the son is kidnapped and I can't remember how old he was, but young, he like was second young. or third grade. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, you know, because I'm putting them in this horrible, awful place and dangerous situation, it, it actually helps me to create some distance because, mm -hmm. you know, I probably couldn't have written these things when I was a mother of kids that age, then yeah. it would have been too close. But now that my kids are older and fine and out of the house and, you know, um, it's easier for me to write these stories about the younger kids. And I, I love putting kids on the page any age, actually, yeah. because like in your book, Jules is so wise and she's actually, I think you said holding up a mirror, but she's also saying, you know, calling her mother out, like your and dad's relationship is not good. And why are you still together? And, you know, for Desi, that was kind of a, maybe a light bulb moment. Completely. And Georgina, yeah. hi, Georgina. Um, she asked a question and said, Someone asked me this recently in an interview and I'd never uh, been asked this before. So here goes. <laughs> if you could be any character in one of your books, who would it be and why? Hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. 
I think I'd want to be, so my first book, not her daughter, which is still my, my favorite, um, which is about a woman who kidnaps a five-year-old to save her from her physically abusive mother. I think I'd want to be the kidnapper. I think I'd want to be Sarah Walker (laughs) because it's based on a real mother daughter that I saw. And I still think about that little girl, but just. I I think that would be so interesting doing something that is so inherently wrong, kidnapping in order to do good in order to save her. Um, I, cause I don't know what I would do in that situation. I think that would be really interesting and tough. Mm, yeah. What about you? I don't know because like all my books, <laughs> these four characters, I really put them through the ringer. Yep. Um, <laughs> maybe I think uh, Gia from my very first book, The Last Breath. Oh, yeah. Um, she comes home to take care of her father who has been released from prison, compassionate release. Um, so he's basically coming home from prison to die. Um, and she is taking care of him and, and discovering whether or not he did this horrible, awful thing that he spent the past 16 years in prison for, which was basically murder. Um, that's a great book. So, I love that book. Yeah, I liked it. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's set kind of where I grew up in Tennessee, but on the Eastern side of the state. So it, it was a very personal story for me to write as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But speaking of Eastern Tennessee and mountains, <laughs> let's talk about that bear scene because I had to kind of read it like this. That one freaked me out. Like, where did that come from? Yeah. Um, so I've obviously never been attacked by a bear, thankfully. <laughs> um, but I think that whenever you write about nature or in Desi's case, she builds this gorgeous house, you know, on these mountains in this town and thinks everything's going to be great. But mother nature is tough and it comes with a huge responsibility and Jules and Peter are both a bit of survivalists and it's Jules 18th birthday party. She has some friends over, they're going out into the woods to see the shelter that they've built. And one of the, one of her friends is attacked by a bear and it's a pretty, it is a pretty gruesome scene. And I thought it was important though, as a writer to show Jules in action because she wants Mm -hmm. to actually be an EMT or paramedic. And I needed something on the page that was going to, going to show that. And, you know, every time I go hiking and I've been, I'm an avid hiker. Uh, My parents exposed us to it uh, very, very young, but I always think about bears. I think about, you know, my daughter goes hiking with me um, and what, what I would do in that situation. But it was a scene that my editor wanted to cut completely. She was mm-hmm. like, I don't think it's important. I don't think it moves the story forward. Um, but I wanted to keep it. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I did because I've, I've definitely heard from a few readers about it. Um, but it was a, yeah, it was pretty gruesome one to write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was hard. It was hard for me to read just because I'm terrified of that when I go hiking too, oh, yeah. like any, not just bears, but like anything that could anything. bite me or kill me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we just Snake. found out down the road from us. Um, there's a guy who's like breeding Dobermans and he showed us pictures. This is literally down the road from us of a bobcat coyotes yeah. and See? wolves. Um, yeah, no. and he's like, don't let your daughter outside by herself. No um, wear bells. Do you have like all the bear spray and the bear, the bells and all that stuff? You don't No, no <sighs> we don't. We're just, we're just winging it. <laughs> we should. We absolutely should. Um, Get some bear spray. Yes. All right. Indeed. So let's see, there's another question. If anybody out there has questions, make sure to drop them in the comments or in the chat. Um, how do you know, Marianne Richmond asked, how do you know when you have the ending or do you know the end before you begin and work backwards? I love these questions. I do too. I think it's different, a little bit different with every book. I mean, some books come to me beginning, like all the way beginning to end, but it usually is with the end first, which is strange. But hmm. now that I'm thinking about it, the ending of books, I usually know how I want them to end. This one, totally different. I mean, I had a very like, crazy, crazy ending when it was more of a thriller. Um, what about you? Do you always, yeah, I, I, I write from an outline. I spend a lot of time on an outline before I write the first word, but that's just because, you know, my stories, thrillers generally have a bunch of moving pieces that you have to all keep, you know, 
tied together somehow. And I, my brain can't come up with that on the fly. I have to, yeah. I have to map it out way in advance. You've always been an outliner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. I with that. Um, <laughs> I want to be so badly, but yeah. I, I mean, I, and I, I kind of, I mean, I do, but I don't write. I know some people that write like 20 page outlines or 40 page outlines. Are you that detailed? I'm not a 40 page outline, but I could get close to 20 for sure because I'm, you know, I'm doing it chapter by chapter. Yeah, completely. Um, Yeah. Do you write in order of the outline or do you skip? Pretty much. I write in order of the outline, except when I'm doing a book like yours, where you have multiple points of view that are maybe the stories are happening at the same time, but maybe not so connected to each other, you know? So did you do that? Did you write first Desi's and then Jules or did you? I tend to write all, all, almost in, if it's dual points of view, which I have always done, I actually do write them one after the other. So I don't follow one all the way through at the end. I'll, I'll separate them and put mm-hmm. them out in, in order. Like right now I'm working on a book with parallel, t- um, just timelines. Um, so that's been very easy to separate and, and look at the whole arc of the story, but it's so, and I think it's always so interesting to see how people put it together. Everyone seems mm-hmm. way more organized than I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you're a really fast writer too. You write super fast, right? I do. I mean, I, ha- I just, I have to, unfortunately just running a business and, um, client work comes first. And yeah, so my, my writing time is always in these little fast and furious chunks. I always joke that I could probably write something just incredible if I had more than like a month or two to do it. Wow. <laughs> I would love to see, you know, but I, but I'm also not someone who could sit with a story for a year or a year and a half without mm-hmm. it shifting so much. I think it would be something completely different because I always love to go back and, and hack at it. And fiddle. Yeah. But yeah. You're pretty fast as well. Though. Mm, I'm not, not some, so- some books come out fast and others like the one I just turned in, it was like a, almost a 10 month thing, well, but it was sense. just, yeah. 10 yeah. Months, though. yeah my, I missed my deadline, which has never happened to me, but you know, I mean, some stories just need more time to breathe and well, um, there were a lot of distractions for me this past year. And so it was just, you know, a perfect storm of stuff. Well, and I think a lot of times people don't realize the pressure that authors feel to produce. Yes. And you do have these concentrated windows, but then you have all this time before it's published. But because 10 months, quite honestly, with life and everything going on to go through a couple of iterations, that's not a lot of time. But in right. order to feel relevant as an author, we feel like we have to have a book a year, a book a year, yeah. a book a year. And it can be a little brutal to, I think, push the process like that so much instead of letting an idea breathe, instead of stepping away from it for two or three months and then coming back to it. It's just, it's kind of, you know, fast and furious I 100% agree. And then if you have a book a year, you're not just writing, right? You're oh. writing and then you get your edits back for your other book and then you have promotions and it's like, you never, ever, ever oh. get a break ever. It is so funny. I think we have talked about this before where every time you're promoting a book, you're in edits for yeah, another or book. deadline. And I told myself, it's funny launching this book. I mean, I have so many clients right now and just all these, I'm like, why did I do this to myself? Why did I schedule everything at once? And why did I not just take like six weeks and this is what I'm going to do. Um, but I think we are so used to multi-focusing and multitasking. Mm -hmm. It's just distraction, distraction, distraction. I just wonder what we could get done if it was singular focus. This is what you're going to do. Just one thing and do it well until it's done. Yeah all the distractions. I don't even know what that would feel like. All the distraction and all the pressures of Pressure. like, here's your deadline and it has to be, you know, fully formed by this date. Well, and the deadline's one thing, but then the launch of a book, I was actually yeah. um, just interviewing two amazing authors on my podcast today and they self-publish and they were talking about the freedom that comes with, they write a book, they can put it up next week if they want. 
they purchase some ads, the book comes out, and then they move on. There's no quote unquote launch in the traditional sense and worrying about sales and numbers. And of course they're worried about those things, but it, they're always moving forward yeah. on their own terms. And I think there's something right. really, really beautiful about that. Yeah. And writing the story that, that, you know, you really want to write that is, you know, speaking to you, which I have a post-it that I'm, every time I sit down to write, I look at it and it says something like the story you have to tell versus you have to tell a story, meaning tell that story that is like bursting out of you that you just have to get out on, on paper because that's what's in your heart. The, 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 story that you want to tell versus you're on deadline. So you have to tell a story and well, you better make sure it happens. Well, compl- and I, I wonder about that because you're such a prolific writer and I feel like you're always, you're selling an, another book before the other ones even come out and you're, you are always writing forward, but do you ever have that panic? Cause this happens to me sometimes where I worry that I'm just going to run out of ideas like in this yeah. space or, I mean, what about if your little idea well dries up yeah. in terms of you have to turn this book in by this time. And what if it doesn't come? You know, I think yeah. we put this pressure on ourselves, but where do you get your constant well of ideas from? Rest, relaxation. As soon as I turn off my brain and, you know, stop thinking about books and maybe go on vacation and yes. stare at the ocean for a week, that's <sighs> when the ideas come, right? Absolutely. Don't you a think? thousand percent. Hiking through the woods. Yep. We just turned our phones off, completely off this past weekend and our computers and took a true Sabbath for 48 hours. I could not believe the space that I had to think, to breathe. I came yeah. up with a million ideas because I wasn't in reactionary mode all day. I wasn't mm-hmm. just, my attention wasn't constantly pulled away. Um, and we yeah. need to build that in as writers. It's, it's I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cindy. Cindy it, yeah. Cause it's very relevant to what we've been talking about. Um, so for both of you, when you're writing, how much do you focus on writing a sellable book or do you create and let your editor publisher worry about that? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> That's such a good question. Well, how I, honest can we be here? Right? Oh, I'm, I am, <laughs> I am known as the honest author. Um, so I'm actually in this situation right now. Um, Secrets of Our House is my last book with St. Martin's Press. I've had a four book contract with them or yeah, four book contract. And I am moving on. I am seeking other publishers. So I am essentially out of contract. And I had this story come to me that I'm so excited about. I've had a few that I've started, gotten 75 pages in. And I think with those books, I was worrying about writing a sellable book. Ooh, what's going to hit? And what's what's going to take me to the next level? And I don't Mm. think my heart and soul were in those ideas as much as this one that came to me when I was at the ocean, staring into the ocean. And it came to me again from start to finish. So I have been writing that not on deadline, not under a contract. No one's boxing me and no one's telling me what to do or how it's got to be yet. And I have to say there has been so much beauty and freedom in that. And Mm -hmm. A little scary because you wonder what if nobody (laughs) nobody takes it or wants it. But at the end of the day, I've created something I'm actually really, really proud of. And I think it is sellable, but that's a slippery slope with Mm -hmm. writing things that are sellable. What about you? Yeah, same. I mean, I I think if you write the story that that you have to tell, right? Is it like you you have to tell this story? Um I think those are the stories that also um, land uh, harder, right? Yes. Because you're telling it with passion and you've, you've got this, this creation that you've, you know, made and sent out into the world feels very different than when an editor says, and this isn't how it works with my editor by far, but, you know, they say, okay, you have to write this story now. And how about this premise? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, completely. It's just, it's just a very different feeling. And so I'm kind of at that same phase. I just turned in this last book. It's the last one in my contract. And, um, I'm thinking about, you know, what my next one's going to be. Yeah. But you know, I have to kind of pitch a book. So, um, are you going to pitch it to them? Are you going to 
spread your I wings. Think I, I think <laughs> I have to pitch it to them. I'm pretty yeah. sure they have the right of first yeah. refusal. So, um, and you know, I, I'll just see what happens yeah. if they love it or not. But I, you know, I've been wanting to write a book set in Amsterdam for a really long time. Yes. And I keep pitching books that are set in Amsterdam and I keep yes. getting them shot down. So oh. I think it might be one of those. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I'm, a, I, actually about to go to the beach and stare at the water so hopefully I'll come back with a really fabulous idea oh I love it I love so, it yeah so but let's get back to your book because um I also wanted to ask about the um the plane and the flying and Jules's fear of flying like yes. where did that come from are you yeah. a scared flyer well I used to not be and I, I'm fine now I mean I, I fly but I had a horrible flight where we had to get in crash position. Oh my God. And it was like, this, this is it. We're, we're going down. It was into Chicago. Um, and since that I wasn't mentally scared of flying, but my body, this was in my twenties, but my body Mm -hmm. would just have this reaction. I mean, it used to be bad. And I think it's a control thing for sure. Um, but in this book, it's probably like PTSD. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like you're going to die and then everybody's <laughs> fine. And it, it was such a, a sharp, you know, turn of events, but Jules is 17. She's definitely afraid of flying. And her boyfriend is a pilot, um, of prop planes. And so during this, I actually went to, uh, Benton, Tennessee, which is three hours from here. And there was this husband wife duo, um, where they do glider planes. So she rides, she drives the, um, prop plane and her husband is in the glider plane. And I was like, I'm going up in this. Cause I just wanted to be in a small plane. It's been a long time since I've been in a, mm-hmm. a prop plane or a small plane, but it was so weird to get up there. And then I push this button and it releases. And then we, we are in a motorless plane. Yeah. Yes. I've been in a glider plane before and you're exactly right. Like you're up and you hear the plane in front yep. of you, right? It's like, yep. and then all of a sudden you're just, you, you are cut loose and it yep. is silence. Silence. It, it was, <laughs> and the plane looks like, I mean, it literally looked like it was put together with duct tape. I mean, there yes. was stuff everywhere and it yes. was such a windy day and it was amazing though. And, and, but you know, I'm not going to give things away in the book, but the last third of it, it's a, it's kind of a, a do or die, live or die situation. Yeah. Um, so for me, I always like kind of writing about things that scare me in real life too. So it was, it was fun to, to play that out on the page. Yeah. Yeah. It was scary. I actually, I have a book, the marriage lie that ha- touches on a plane crash. It's yeah. It's, yes. It doesn't yep. just touch on a plane crash. The I premise know. is that the husband dies in a plane crash. Yes. But, and you know, I talked before about Amsterdam. I'm always going back and forth. So I'm on a plane all the time. But when I was writing that book, because I had to research all the things that can go wrong on a plane, oh gosh. I took a lot of Xanax on those flights, man. Yeah. I was like, and, and I'm not a fearful flyer at all, but yeah. you know, it was just very front of mind. It can, it can mess with your mojo for sure. It can, and I, I got over that fear. And then when I became a mother, yeah, every time I would fly without Sophie, I was just like, I cannot die and leave my child without a guardian. And yeah. I've written about yeah. that as well. I love to just write about those types of, of things, but it's always in the back of my head. Yeah. What about this one flight, that one thing goes wrong and you have all that time to think about it on the way down. Just that awareness. <laughs> better um, not to think about it. No, it's better not to think about it. <laughs> Okay. So you talked a little bit before about your other business and your clients. Tell us what that is. Yeah. So, you know, I've been working with um, writers for a really long time. I've been in this industry almost 20 years and I've been an editor, a ghostwriter. I've worked at a literary agency. I've just really tried to understand the industry because it's it's tough and confusing and we can take all the writing classes in the world, but no one teaches us how to be an author, how to be a right. published author, what the business looks like. So, you know, uh, right before the 
pandemic, a couple of years before I created this side hustle where I was helping authors get traditionally published mostly where they wanted to land an agent, land a book deal, whether it was fiction or nonfiction. And I was helping them do that through editing, through pitching agents that I knew, through creating nonfiction book proposals. And it just kind of took off on its own. So at the top of 2020, we created Right Way, which is for writers who want to get published. I'd say 99% of our clients want to get traditionally published, meaning they want the agent, they want the book deal. Um, so they come to us with a concept or idea. We talk about their goals, discover which publication path is right for them. And then we're really with them through the whole process. So if we're working with a nonfiction client, we create their book proposal. We aggregate a list of clients we pit, or uh, agents. We pitch to the agents on their behalf. And in the last two years, we've had over 60 um, first-time authors land agents. That's amazing. It's been incredible. And a lot of those authors have gone on to be best-selling authors and are doing, you know, spreading their message in the world. Um, so that's been incredible. And then we started a podcast at the same time at the top of 2020 to really demystify the publishing industry and tell writers the truth because mm -hmm. we romanticize this industry. There are a lot of misconceptions about this industry. And I think it's really important to just have authors advocate for themselves and yeah. go in with their eyes wide open and understand yeah. everything from money to contracts. Um, so it's really busy and really amazing, but it's so cool to kind of straddle the line between being an author and, and then helping authors. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. And I also think, you know, not every, I mean, we have a great gang, like female yeah. author thriller gang. Right. And we, totally. we tell each other things, but not every author is very transparent Absolutely. always about, you know, how much advance they're getting, oh, yeah. what their contracts are, you know, I mean, so it's hard to navigate that as the first time author. So that's well, great it is. that you guys are helping. Yeah. And I think we can be in our little author groups. We can be honest with each other and we mm -hmm. tell it like it is, but we need to, I, I think people need to start hearing that because it, it's such a, a, such a private industry. And it's one of the only businesses where you don't really discuss money and you don't really discuss how you make a living or what really goes on or what to expect. And I think we have to normalize that conversation a little bit yeah. because I it, agree. It, it's a super romantic industry, right? It's, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you're getting published. It's such a cool, um, timeless thing, yeah. but it's also really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's bottom. super hard. And you yeah. know, you spend so much time trying to get published, writing a book, finding an agent, all that stuff. And then you get your contract and your first book comes out and you think, okay, well, here we go. But in a lot of ways, it only gets harder from there. I think it's so much harder. I mean, I joke all the time about de being a debut author and my little doe eyes. And I was so excited and so naive, but it's the most beautiful time when you were yes. debuting a book and you can dream and no one's telling you what you can't do. And then from there, it's, you start to look at things a little differently. You worry mm -hmm. about your numbers. You worry about that next book or hitting that deadline or is this going to sell or, you know, some of that romance is naturally taken out. Yeah. Yeah. And you have, you know, all the voices in your ears, the readers that loved parts of your book and yeah. the readers that didn't love, because those are generally the most vocal, right? On both sides of the spectrum. Do you read your, like being this far into your career, do you read your reviews or no? I read, you know, when the book first comes out, I kind of keep an eye on my stars and, yeah. you know, just to, just to kind of see where things are. Um, I read the trade reviews because, yeah. you know, I'm a sucker for punishment. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, I, but I don't read every review. You just, you, I can't do that to myself. Yeah. You know, I, I don't either. I mean, sometimes I'll read like you in the beginning or Goodreads, man, Goodreads can be rough. Um, some of those yes. reviews are, are rough, but I always love reading some of the bad reviews because I often sometimes agree with them, quite frankly. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can see that. But I think when you know that no reader is going to universally love your book or, or hate your book, but right. the ones that it connects with, that's, that's just the coolest feeling when you get that message 
Like, oh my yeah. gosh, I literally love this book. Or you see yeah. all the pictures that bookstagrammers mm. take so much time to, to, you know, position your book next to a cup of coffee or flowers. And they're taking yeah. pictures with your physical product. It's the coolest. I thing. know that is the coolest thing. I do love it. Okay. We're at six forty. Does anyone have any remaining questions? Pressing things you must know. <laughs> And remember, you can get, you can pre-order. So Kimberly's hardback book is already out and it's incredible. And you will read it in a day because it's just that good. But your paperback comes out when? March 8th. March, March 8th. 8th. Yeah. Order these that. are these are kind of hard to get, to yes. get your hands on. It took um, I've heard from, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. And they were, they were working on getting more out there. And I think they said, around now. So hopefully there'll be more, um, you know, coming up, but otherwise March 8th is the paperback really. So you can pre-order her book. And if you want a signed copy of secrets of our house, Parnassus has them. I'm literally going there tomorrow to sign some books and then, Oh, Marianne, we can end with, with this question from Marianne. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Would you say there was a moment that changed your off the, off the, yeah, off your journey <laughs> in a significant way, a conversation, a random encounter, some type of promotion? Ooh, you can go with that. Hmm. Um, for me, I think the big, the big, uh, I mean, it's not one particular moment, but, um, when the marriage light came out, that was my third book and it came out at like the very end of the year. And then sometime in January, February, it just like kind of caught fire and just like kind of blew up beyond everyone's expectations, including mine. Um, and it ended up, you know, being nominated for the Goodreads Choice Awards that year. And it was just, it was, it was definitely a defining moment in my career. I love it. Yeah. I don't think I've had mine yet. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think getting, I think getting the book deal in the first place is such a monumental thing. Mm -hmm. when you, I mean, I remember and, and getting, I got, you know, a movie deal before not her daughter came out. I just remember all that being so surreal. And I know the realities of that industry and how long it takes if, if anything um, actually gets made or not. But I think going from not being an author, wanting to be an author to actually getting that validation in some way, and then holding that book in your hand for the oh, yeah. time is a super pivotal moment. Cause then you really mm -hmm. start to believe it. Cause you can hold the proof in your, in your hand. Yeah. It's real. It love becomes it. real. Yeah. Completely. Love fun. it. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, All right. Well, thank, thank you, you guys for being yeah. here. It was so awesome to talk to you as well. I cannot wait until we can do some in-person events know. again. Same. Oh, so great. Um, thank you for everyone who's tuning in and I hope you guys all have a great night and get some good yes. on your list. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.